So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Diogo, and today I'm going to talk about Data Park reflections from a longitudinal deployment of a digital platform for Parkinson's disease monitoring. Um, in more detail, I will talk to you about uh, a brief introduction about what is Parkinson and what are how the ecosystem works to evaluate uh, these uh, persons for the clinicians, and how can technology help um, them to have a better overview of how it's uh, all related with this disease. Uh, then I will move to Data Park, that was our uh, platform to explore this concept. And I will talk to you also about some of the studies that we did in this past year. So let me start by giving us a brief overview of what is Data Park. So it's a platform for continuous monitoring of Parkinson's disease that has two main powers. One of it is, a, is that is a pipeline for data collections on controlled and uncontrolled environments. Uh, it uses an accelerometer for objective data collection. Uh, and the other power is that it's a rich visualization of all the data collected. As you can see on the right, this is an example of a, a report we produce with all the data processed and in the, in the way that it's easy for clinicians to understand. Uh, also uh, below on the slide, you can see the, the sensor that we use for collecting uh, or objective data is the activity uh, AX3. But let's get a few steps back and understand why was Data Park created. So, uh, approximately 1% of the world population suffers from Parkinson's disease, and the main um, the, the main problems that are related with these are the tremors that can affect the hand movements. Uh, are the slowed movements, uh, for, for example, where the kinesia that uh, in specific related with wa walking and the gait, uh, it slows down uh, the movement of these people. So, and with the increase of the disease stage, is something that will um, decrease the, the quality uh, when regarding the, the walking. Another one is the impaired balance and posture. So, it's difficult for these people to maintain, for some of these people to maintain the, the balance. And this can influence also uh, other related programs. As for example, uh, they tend to fall. And this, of course, if there is uh, no one uh, on their side, can lead to a, a major problem. Uh, and also, uh, the symptoms on this disease tend to fluctuate a lot during the day and do, during the, the long periods uh, or a year and, a, and all of it, and it's very relevant to understand all of these situations because in these situations are most of the systems that happen and not only when these uh, persons go to an evaluation. But how are they evaluated? So most of it is in controlled environments evaluations where a, neuro, uh, where a person goes to a, an appointment with a neurologist and the neurologist tries to assess what how is the current disease stage uh, uh, by asking questions and other relevant assessments. But it's not all in that, it's uh, the sum of all the areas. So uh, physiotherapy, it evaluates motor impairments, psychology that uh, evaluates cognitive malfunctions. So all of this sum up gets like the picture of how is this person uh, at the current stage and what areas should we address it to improve uh, their, their symptoms and their, their quality of life in general. Uh, one of it is physical evaluations. So try to understand what are the uh, motor uh, programs that this person had that is related with gait, that is related with balance. So there are a couple of assessment, pre-validated assessments that evaluate all of this and also Another important point is act as a rehabilitation. So do exercises to improve uh, how a person walks or how a post uh, person maintains his posture. And one of the assessments are the physical ones, but there are also some pre-validated questionnaires that try uh, to capture uh, other things related with the cognitive aspects, with how a person was when they are outside of a controlled environment. And all of this is part of the, all the areas that evaluate uh, Parkinson's uh, disease patients. Uh, but how about what they collect about uncontrolled environments? 
as I mentioned, it is uh, mostly uh, it's, it's based on questionnaires. Some of them, when they go to that appointment and uh, fill out uh, uh, like uh, how was the how is the degree of independence in the, in the activities of the living? How was their overall um, uh, disease stage? So uh, try to understand a different bunch of experts related with the disease with these private related questionnaires. Uh, but also sometimes they can be prescribed some questionnaires to be filled at home and try to, uh, in a day by day basis, uh, try to understand what is happening with that person. Another point is uh, also the clinicians uh, can ask additional questions from the ones that are private related, like what was the major symptoms that you felt uh, between appointments uh, and try to get more information about this. Uh, of course, this uh, the patient uh, regards to recall to try to uh, explain uh, what were the major symptoms. Uh, and sometimes they also can hide information. So it's not uh, not all the things will be captured with these questions and these, these and these questionnaires. It's, it's just uh, the best overview possible. So like I mentioned before, this uh, this disease tends to the symptoms tend to fluctuate a lot. So it's very important to have all of this information. I'll try to address all of this information to for the clinicians to take better decisions regarding medication, regarding rehabilitation, uh, to improving the quality of life of these persons. So that said, our two research questions were uh, how to continue with monitoring patients in uncontrolled environment. So uh, as, as I said, uh, in the controlled environments, there are already uh, pre-validated assessments that try to capture uh, when people go to evaluations. But the part that is related when, when people are at their daily lives and where most of the uh, fluctuations happen, more of the symptoms tend to happen, uh, there are not an objective way of, of doing it. And also the, the subjective way, like I mentioned, are uh, regarding problems with recall and people. Uh, it's not easy to get all this information. So our first question is to how can we continue to model these patients? And the other relevant aspect is after collecting of all of this information, processing, using uh, the appropriate algorithms, how can you give meaning to this data using the rich visualizations that clinicians need? Because they have um, uh, less time to, to try to process all of this information. So it's difficult for them in an appointment of five minutes or 10 minutes to try to uh, give meaning to a data that it's not in an adequate format, that, that we, they will not have time to do it. Another aspect, for example, when we started this collaboration, uh, one of the neurologists said, okay, I know that there are sensors that provide raw data, but how can I benefit from this raw data? How can I give meaning to this raw data? And this is another one of the challenges. But now let's go in more detail and understand what is really data. Part. So uh, this is the, the expert of, of our platform. So it's just the, in this case is an example of the patient profile, a fictitious patient profile, as to show you that the, uh, the amount of information and the, the outlook of our page. Let's now get in detail in the different aspects. So regarding the control of the environments, our goal was to support the clinical evalu evaluation. We don't want them to change the kind of assessments they do, how they do it. We just wanted to add an extra layer to it uh, and like an optional step, get, they can benefit for having more information about the current assessments they already do. To do this, uh, we use uh, accelerometer sensors, activity, like I mentioned before, in both wrist and lower back. Also, we have an Android application that I will explain uh, in more detail. And the, also, some of the questionnaires, they are also in a digital way. Regarding the Android application, the main goal is, was to support, in this case, the physical evaluation. So to support the, the physiotherapy area that do these kinds of evaluation. So what they had at the time was just pen and paper and econometry because some of the exercises needed to be, uh, the time needed to be measured to obtain the final score and get the assessment uh, for that uh, task uh, for each, for that patient. Uh, so what we do is first get all of this in an application 
also with the goal of having, having annotated data for the objectives that had been collected. So if we don't have this, that extra step, we only had the objective data, but you didn't know what you were not able to extract specific information about each one of the exercises. So uh, what we have also is some, flex, some degree of flexibility. So they can choose what kind of exercises they want to, pref to perform, don't need to follow an order. They can also have more metadata information. So the reason why a person was not able to do some kind of exercises, and this tends to happen a lot, especially as, uh, mainly with persons that has a high degree uh, of the disease, because sometimes they are not able to perform some of the exercises requested. Uh, and also to adapt to the constraints of uh, having this application in a real world, we had to add some uh, extra layers of, for example, supporting the on offline mode. So they don't have to need uh, to have access to the internet to uh, fill out and do all this pipeline, because as I said, in a real world environment, they, they, they have to do this immediately. They don't have time to repeat this again and again if something went wrong. So we need to support all of this and adapt to the constraints uh, of uh, this specific pipeline. Another one is the digital questionnaire. So the other areas uh, like uh, uh, nutrition, speech therapy, uh, also um, wanted to have like this, uh, their questionnaires on a, a platform or integrated with data part. And what we saw is that, okay, we can add these other questionnaires, but if they need some kind of changes or if they need to adapt some of it, they will always be depending on someone with technologic background to do it. So what we did was give this authority to the end user. So we created a mechanism uh, for them to create their own uh, questionnaires as they wanted, a similar mechanism as you can see on the Google Forms when you, you create your questionnaires is a similar approach. So we drag and drop boxes uh, and decide what kind of questions and what kind of content you want in them. Uh, also, if they notice that something is not as expected when uh, applying that, uh, uh, that questionnaire, they can edit it in real time. Uh, also, of course, passing from the paper to a digital approach, this can this give them also um, the possibility of a better comparison between different evaluations. Now they can uh, have access to the difference between uh, what happened in the past 10 evaluations and how is the current state now without needing to uh, manually uh, go to all the papers of the different questionnaires people feel when go to these evaluations. Regarding the uncontrolled environments, what we did is support con a continuous monitoring by using a spherometer sensor, both in wrist and lower back. Uh, some examples of data that we extract is the XVM to get an overview uh, of the degree of um, physical activity that a person has. And also regarding the sleep, for example, understand the number of wake-ups or if the person has uh, some kind of perturbance during their sleeping. The other expert uh, that I want to talk to you about is the dashboards for visualization. So the other part, the other research question that we wanted to address. So from now on, I want to talk to you about how does the data collection process works. But uh, this one is also a very relevant step that how to show this information to clinicians. So here I have two examples of a free weaving report and the laboratory report that in this case is uh, on the specific exercise of C210 that adapts the, the metrics uh, to these specific exercises. And in the free weaving one, people can choose what kind of information they want, uh, what uh, period they, see they want to see if by day, if, uh, by week, uh, depending on the, met on the specific metric. Also, as you could see in the beginning, there is a summary dashboard that has the a summary of all the information from a patient and also some uh, visualizations. And all of this also allows a comparison of different assessments, for example, different questionnaires that are filling in different periods of evaluation. Um, this is another example of uh, how to collect uh, data in an uncontrolled environment. Uh, so what we did here was if if there is the need to fill a, to a patient to fill a questionnaire uh, when they are uh, at their homes, at their daily lives, 
uh, how can we support this throughout technology? So again, we did uh, an, an tool for the, the clinicians to build uh, their own workflows. So a similar approach to the one of creating questionnaires. Now here they can choose uh, the questions they want to be applied or the questionnaires they want to be applied and define uh, according to um, to the answer of, of it, if it's yes or no, they can define different paths for the, the for to be uh, new questions or uh, new things to be added. I can give you an example. For example, if together with the, the brain set, if we detect there is a freeze of gate, for example, uh, the, the workflow can define that the question is prompted to the user or an automatic call to an emergency service or to a doctor or to a relative can also be part of this workflow. Uh, but getting back again to the, to the example of a question, if the question is, how was your day? The clinician can choose, uh, for example, to apply this for a period of a week, every time, every day at two o'clock uh, to this uh, question to be answered. Uh, this then is uh, gets to the, the patient throughout two mechanisms. One of it is an application where they receive a notification and can uh, answer to, to, to these questions or uh, what is prompted to them. Uh, another one is using an automatic call system. So we support this throughout an EVF system, so an invoice response system, that is basically an interactive menu where people can choose uh, the, the numbers and answer to the questions or just use, uh, also speak to the, the, the phone and we record the audio and th that is also information that is used then for the clinician to decide. Uh, so this allows flexibility to, to the clinician to choose what and when is being applied to his patients. Uh, just summing up about the data collection and the data set. So uh, we have three years of real world deployment since 2018. And in that period, we have more than 900 subjects uh, with more than uh, 150 gigabytes of data that came from in the wild data collection, annotated data, the ones that you saw that are uh, specific to the exercises being uh, used in the physiotherapy assessment, and also some data sets that we uh, have annotated for specifics for specific studies, and some of them I will talk uh, more in more detail in the next slides. But why to do a longitudinal deployment? So. Uh, let me uh, explain you how to de designing technology in healthcare has a lot uh, of constraints. Uh, of course, designing technology in general is also has, but in healthcare specifically, uh, we have not only to address the users that we use this kind of application, in this case, the clinicians, but also having considerations that they are dealing with the patient. Uh, someone that sometimes they will have to deal with decisions that affect uh, their life and their future. And this needs to also be taken in consideration. So uh, what I want to say is that the specific in a healthcare, you should be, uh, the end user should be involved in the process of design since the beginning until the end. For example, in the prescribing 10,000 10, steps like, like aspirin, uh, what they did was a user-centered design of an application for clinicians, where they started from interviewing them uh, at the beginning to understand what was their needs, and then move it to uh, having them involved in the phase of prototyping, and also to validate the application, the final prototype uh, at the end. Uh, another example is the designing a clinician facing two. So in this case, they, uh, they, they use it an iterative design uh, uh, approach with clinicians with a long period of time, with six months uh, of an application to get data from patients, uh, from patient social media activity. And the main outcome here is, again, they, uh, the clinicians, the users were uh, involved in the design, design of the application since the beginning. And this helped to minimize the clinician's workloads. Uh, another different example is the ones about robot deployment in long-term care. In this case, they used a case study on, on using a mobile robot to support physiotherapy. And this was a long-term deploy in a uh, um, 
a care, um, a care center uh, that was more than a year when they used this uh, robot to support the physiotherapy uh, uh, re uh, rehabilitations of these older adults. And the goal is here is they want, what they did with this study is not just adapt uh, the, the robot uh, in uh, real world deployment, but also uh, what the, the output of this is address the challenge of the real world based not only on the experience from the researchers, so what they were not managing this uh, long term deploy, but also uh, the ones from the caregivers. And the measure of the two uh, gives more information uh, about uh, the constraints of maintaining uh, these kinds of long term deploys. So it's it's not only from the technology point of view, but also the constraints that the caregivers need to adapt to having this extra technology in their uh, daily, uh, daily approaches with the, the patients. Uh, the last one that I want to mention, it's the, the human body is a black box. That it's a deep learning uh, model to support clinical decision making in the hospital for people with sepsis. Uh, here, uh, they not then they not only try to get an understandable understandable AI model at the end, but they also again incorporated the clinicians since the uh, the process of designing. So what they explain here in detail is the means and goals for getting fair, accountable, and transparent machine learning values from the design uh, until the practice and the usage in the real world. So the, the main takeaway that uh, I want to focus is that we should design for people with people. So like the examples that I mentioned before, uh, you should try to incorporate uh, uh, your end user as soon as possible in the design process because you will benefit from having his input. He's, he's a domain expert. And also at the end, you have a prototype much more richer with their input than without them. Uh, we did this in that part. As uh, we mentioned this in the next slides, how was the, the process and the studies that we did. But we try to do this with Data Park, in having a close collaboration with the clinicians and trying to involve them as soon as possible in the design process. Also, if possible, try to do embedded research, like the example on the robots, that the, the researchers were also in some of the sessions, and this helped them to adapt their technology to the constraints in, uh, on the real world. So it, of course, uh, having the input from the clinicians is essential, but having the opportunity to be uh, there and see the environment and see some constraints and how the technology can adapt to them, it's also very important. Uh, again, uh, with Data Park, we had this opportunity to be part of some of the physiotherapy evaluations and see uh, the different um, points that they have to take in consideration when doing an evaluation. So they have to look to at first pen and paper now and, uh, and smartphone application. Then they have to uh, perform that evaluations and also, and more important to look out to the patients. If something bad can happen to them, they have to be there. Hampton, for example, if they are doing a balance exercise, uh, sometimes they tend to uh, lose their balance and this can lead to a fall. So it's important and these constraints help us in the case of data park helps us to build a better technology so the final message is when designing for healthcare is even more well relevant these two points of designing for people with people with people and doing embedded research so now let me focus in some of the studies uh, that you did uh, that we did in these uh, past years so first let me talk about uh, designing for living reports uh, was a, one of our first studies uh, that is div was divided in two parts. First of all, is trying to understand the clinicians' needs, so what they wanted, uh, what kind of information they wanted, what they see uh, that should be uh, the, the data, and some prompts about how can this uh, be visualized. visualized. Uh, so what we did was a focus group with five participants from different areas, from their neurology, uh, physiotherapy, and nursing. Uh, and the main goal was to feeling and discussing about different countries in the boards that you ca can see some examples at the, at the, the picture on the right. So the, the one about devices, 
was uh, for them to see what are the devices they uh, out see that have potential to collect information about this disease. So of course they mentioned uh, smartphones, uh, sensors, barometer sensors, but there are others like having a sensor on a pen to try to measure um, how a person is writing or having uh, also on the TV remote uh, to capture these fluctuations uh, related to tremors that the disease has. Uh, another point is related with activity. So what kind of activities they see potential to be measured and they are relevant for this disease. Uh, they talked about uh, sweeping, um, physical activity in general, but also some activities of daily living, uh, like uh, washing the dishes or do the laundry. Uh, then we ask them to uh, go in more detail about each one of these activities to mention what kinds of data they wanted from them. For example, regarding the sweep, they mentioned uh, the ones related with uh, knowing the number of cups a person has or how much changes in the sweep positions they have, because in case of Parkinson, uh, this is relevant to have this information. At the end, we ask them to draw a possible report. Um, as most of them just enumerate the data points they wanted uh, to have, so the data they wanted to have in the different uh, areas. Uh, and finally, because we had, of course, a constraint of time in this, in this first study, uh, there was a lot of interest from the part of the clinicians. And then we decided, OK, let's now move this discussion to digital boards. We at the time used a travel. First, we passed all of these um, paper boards to the digital ones. Uh, and then giving uh, opening this to not only the ones that participated uh, on that focus group, but also other clinicians that could contribute uh, with that. Uh, our major findings were at sweep gate and physical activity metrics were the most relevant uh, for clinicians. Um, at the digital boards, it emerged a, a, a different one, a different board. And it is the scenarios one, when, where we asked uh, to describe a situation and anticipate what could be the possible output. An example is the freeze of gate detection. So if uh, uh, the freeze of gate uh, is detected, then we can add uh, according to that. So a uh, call to an emergency service, call to a relative, or, or just uh, ask uh, posterior confirmation with these patients to validate also the data collection process and also just try to help these people to overcome that situation, trying to use the same mechanisms that the, the physiotherapists use in the controlled environments. And of course, it informed the report's uh, design process that followed. Uh, then the next step was co designing these reports with the clinician. Uh, it was like uh, a couple of months to design all of this since the first prototype, the first discussions that happened. And then we together uh, designing uh, the, the final prototype. You can, uh, the examples were the ones that you saw uh, in the previous uh, slides. Um, and what you, what you did at the time to validate this was deploy uh, data park and specifically these free living reports for two months in the clinic. Uh, we collected data from 22 uh, patients uh, that used the spherometer sensor during seven days and had also pre and post rehabilitation evaluations that uh, are the ones that are performed in a controlled environment. At the end, we did semi structured interviews with clinicians uh, with the goal of uh, understanding if the reports are useful in the clinical practice and also if uh, using sensors during all of this clinical practice makes some kind of disturbance uh, of the current assessment. So the major findings were that patients enjoying to have an overview of how uh, their week was, so especially regarding the energy expenditure and the levels of activity uh, that foot weight uh, during that, that period of time. Also, the clinicians reported there were no changes in taking care of patients by using sensors. That was one of our concerns and one of the things that we wanted uh, to understand with this study. And also that the functional reports were of easy comprehension. 
so if you want to know more detail about this, we have a publication uh, that is uh, noted below in this way. Uh, then, also informant for the, uh, from the first study, we move it to and get uh, with an expert system approach. So what we did was using state-of-the-art algorithms that was based on wave odds and initial contact and final contact approaches, and then try to validate uh, uh, validated our algorithm and then move it to a study uh, where the focus was trying to see if the, the tech that is one of the best indicators for this disease what is the relation of gate with uh, this indicator that is uh, being used by uh, clinicians to evaluate this disease? So what we did was collecting data from 24 participants that use an spherometer on the lower back. Uh, they use it in a free living uh, context uh, three days for three days, this device, and also had supervised assessments at the beginning and at the end that consisted on performing two tests time upon go that is when a, a person starts seated down seated down then stands up do a walk do a turns uh, do a walk again and sit down uh, and also the 10 meter walk uh, assessment so uh, our uh, main findings were that in the free weaving constant context the step as, uh, symmetry seems to provide a more realistic picture uh, of the impact of this disease uh, in Parkinson's disease when compared uh, to uh, the tech. Also, that the length of the walking bout, so the, the different, what we did is dividing these walking bouts uh, by time, so less than 50 seconds, more than 60 seconds, and then try uh, to see if there was like some kind of correlation or some differences in the different lengths of the walking bouts. And what we discovered, uh, is that, that the longer the walking bouts are, the higher the velocity and length of stride and step, and, low, and the lower canvas variability and the symmetry. Uh, regarding the supervised assessments, the step went was the one uh, that the gate parents with, were the, have the best ability to predict the tech. So in supervised step went and free weaving the step time asymmetry were the ones that can better predict what is the result of tech that is one of the most validated assessments uh, that is used by clinicians. Uh, again, if you want to know more about this, uh, you can, we have this oh, more detail in, in our paper that it's again uh, below. Uh, so now we, uh, more recently, we started to try a different approach that is uh, looking to uh, machine learning, to machine learning detections, but uh, trying to compare pair uh, the one general model that uh, has a trains a data set and then apply it to uh, having a personalized approach individually for each one of the, uh, the, the participants. In this case of Parkinson, it's because of the, diff the fluctuations that happen during the day, even in the same person, uh, it's uh, well, one of the questions that we had if this personalized approach could have better results in the detecting gate. Uh, so what we did was collecting a data set with 20 participants with neurological conditions, so Parkinson's disease and stroke. We have 10 hours of data annotated uh, that classifies uh, between gate and non-gate events. Uh, what we did was applying deep, deep learning general and personalized models to narrow networks and conventional narrow networks. And our goals were uh, to see the, what is the impact of personalized versus general models, and why and when should personalized model, should a personalized model be used. So these are our results. So uh, the personalized model increased the accuracy uh, in average 3.5 on neural networks with a maximum uh, increase of 16.9%. And regarding conventional neural networks, it was in average 5.3% with a max of 20.5%. There are a few cases where this discrete, the personalized model decreases the accuracy. So our findings were that high improvements for participants on the extremes of the spectrum of motor impairment. So the ones with lowest movement scores or the one that had good overall scores were the ones that have the, the higher improvement that benefits the most from having a personalized approach. 
So we use a Schwarzenegger English scale to evaluate the degree of, that evaluates the degree of independence of activities of daily life. Uh, mini best that evaluates uh, the balance for both stra uh, stroke and Parkinson's disease, and to evaluate uh, PD participants, we use the MDS to PDRS. And uh, what uh, we achieve with this is that uh, personalized model are good for these uh, extreme cases. And also uh, that personalized models are good for increasing the accuracy of the outliers on a, on a data set. Uh, if you look to, for example, this data set or data sets in general, of course, there will be outliers. And maybe they will benefit more of having, of having a personalized approach compared to applying the general one. Uh, and also uh, another take, take away is that uh, when for micro uh, gate features, for example, the step asymmetry, the impact of the wrongly classified bouts can be potentially huge. So if uh, the amount of uh, wrongly classified bouts uh, is uh, high enough can affect the, the decisions that the clinicians uh, may have uh, looking throughout this metric. So it's important to have the best accuracy possible. And also uh, sometimes finding significant data sets for every type of population, it's not easy. So maybe for the cases that you don't have a huge data set using a personalized approach can have a uh, Good results, good, good accuracy results, as we show it uh, uh, in this study. Of course, uh, to have uh, really um, better uh, informed about this, we need to test uh, all of our pipeline with a, uh, a data set even bigger. Now I'm moving to a, a different approach that is uh, regarding the visualization of data. So it's one of our most recent studies. Uh, that what we're looking for with this is trying to understand if in the different what are the differences that have in the different areas of evaluation of a patient. So uh, nursing, speech therapy, nutrition, physiotherapy, psychology, and occupational therapy. So what are the, the, the data that each one needs and how are the symmetries between these areas? So we did six sections, one of with, with different areas. Uh, in total, we had uh, 15 participants. And our goal was by one side, understand how their clinical evaluation now works. So what kind of uh, data they collect now, what kind of instruments they use to collect this data, but also to understand if they see potential, what other uh, data they see potential to be collected. And if there was no limitations in uh, budget, uh, in technology, what were the expectations of information they wanted to, they wanted to have? Uh, and also at the end, we asked them to uh, develop their ideal dashboards individually, uh, but so get based on the data they wanted to be collected, how they should be organized, and also to help them. We used some uh, magnets with examples of visualization. So if a data should be a progression or should be a comparison, uh, just to help them uh, to inform us better of how they want that data. Uh, what we expected to find was the different types of data, the different instruments. So if they wanted to use, or if they use a smartphone, a sensor, a questionnaire, pen and paper to collect uh, all of these informations, and also the different methods they use, if it's a control and or uncontrolled environment, if it's objective or subjective data. So uh, in the, on the right, you can see an example of a dashboard. In this case, that was built by the physiotherapy area. As you can see, they used the magnets to inform us about uh, how the data should be present and also so the data and the organization they wanted uh, from all the data, both on controlled and uncontrolled environments. Uh, so our, our findings about this study were that there was asymmetries between controlled and controlled environments. So most of the areas focus on uh, collecting data from uh, controlled environments. Uh, so when people go to their uh, evaluations and they collect all the data they need, but uh, apart from the, the subjective data they collect from the questionnaires about the controlled environments and in specific in the area of physiotherapy, that they also use sensors to continuous monitoring of the disease. 
the other areas don't use uh, objective data collected from uncontrolled environment, but they all see potential in using sensors and use other kinds of mechanisms to collect uh, data from these contexts. Uh, also, another point is the different similarities and heterogeneities between the different areas. So, nurturing, for example, is the central point uh, in all, of all the areas. So, all the demographic data, all the phaseology data that is being collected is done by these areas. So, all the other areas benefit from having this kind of knowledge also uh, in a digital uh, dashboard and having access to this instead of having to ask uh, to all uh, the, their colleagues. Also, there are some areas that uh, are seems to be different, but are interested in the same data points. For example, nutrition and speech therapy. Uh, both want to know more about uh, how is uh, related with the throat, related with how people eat. So they have points in common. And another example is the one regarding psychology that is more interested in cognitive uh, impairments uh, and uh, physiotherapy that is more interested in motor impairments. However, uh, some of the exercises that the uh, psych psychology uh, asks patients to do uh, will benefit from knowing if a person has uh, tremor problems because it will affect uh, the ability to perform these exercises and they need to be adapted. Uh, another uh, the last point is the barriers to technology adop adoption. So, for example, we, uh, we know that nursing is not using any digital questionnaires. So they only regard to pen and paper and write down all the, the things they evaluate uh, when uh, seeing a patient. Uh, and we need to understand and we understand how why they don't use uh, this technology. One of the reasons is the time. So they don't have time to use a platform. So maybe the platform and the dashboard needs to be adapted uh, to these constraints in time. It's to be easy to be filled, not only easy to be visualized. Uh, and that said, we, there are some barriers to this uh, technology's adaption that need to be considered when building these dashboards. So uh, I finish. Thank you all for listening to me. Uh, I'm now open to questions. Thank you, Duke, for uh, the variety of different projects. And uh, there's a lot of things here to, to talk about. So I open the floor. Does anyone have a question for Diogo? Uh, Hello. Uh, I have a minor question. First of all, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so there go. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, I am curious a little bit about the personalized model. So what input or what kind of uh, variables you put into personalized model, which you didn't put into the general model? So, okay. So this, this is where uh, uh, project in collaboration. So that part, uh, I don't have now the, the details in here, but uh, we, we will publish this soon. So there will be present. So that part, I, I don't, I cannot now uh, and answer to a question at the moment. Yeah, sorry. I, I think I can talk a little bit. So for the input to the, um, uh, to the neural networks and uh, the CNN, uh, are still the the axis raw values and SVM. So we, we use traditional features. What we do is that after um, or the, the option or the approach that we chose for personalization was um, to have a general model, but then fine tuning it, it's having a step where you, you train it again with individualized data, uh, with a, a small set of individual you know, personal data. Uh, to achieve a personalized model, a model that values more of the of the um, that person's uh, patterns, and so okay. um, yeah, that I think I hope it answered your question. I think that's probably yeah, the answer. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask something, if I may. Uh, yeah, me too. Well. So, 
I, I kind of believe that uh, proper machine learning methods, proper data analysis methods can uncover all sorts of interesting things in the real life data uh, that's being collected. Now, of course, I'm a little biased here, but nonetheless, I, I think this is the case. Uh, however, when you speak with uh, health professionals about what they would like to see in your application, uh, they probably have difficulty imagining what you can do with, with this data. And it's also difficult for you probably to tell them what you can do if you don't know what they want. So how, how do you deal with this? So yeah, uh, I can give you an example. So the last study that we did with dashboards, uh, it tries to answer what we are saying. So it's try to have an activity that will be easy for them. In this case, just tell us about their current practice. And from that, we can extract the information that we need. So, oh, they want this kind of data or they wanted to have this kind of data. And then passing to that second activity of designing some dashboards, they can rationally, rationalize what they imagine, how the information should be. So that help us, uh, of course, we are the experts in that domain and we'll take the decisions about visualization, but to have information about, okay, they want like this in a progression. So for them, it's important to have the notion of the different evaluations or the different variations in this uh, value. So I think the, the rationale is trying to have activities uh, the, with the people that will be easy for them to express, for example, designing or using post-its uh, in, a, in a white folder and that kind of stuff helps people to design in the abstract. And also the example is, for example, if you can have like cards and play like as it was a game, like you have different kinds of devices to be collected and the people have to choose, okay, I want this device, I want this device that do like playful activities with the people uh, to help them uh, to get us where you want. You want to know uh, all these informations, but you need to get like abstract activities to get this output and not ask them directly because otherwise, like you said, it's difficult for them to get us the information that we we want. Uh, thanks. <laughs> I, I think I have a follow-up and I, I probably do go as, as examples, uh, but I think, so one, one of the things that we notice is that by, by having a platform being used in real life, it's a, it's a, it becomes a dialogue. So we don't know what they need and uh, oh, to, to the full extent, and they don't know what technology can give. But every time we deploy something that is a little bit more advanced than what they were used to do, uh, the, the discourse and the dialogue changes a little bit. And we hear several times saying, oh, but if you can do this, would you be able to show us this? And so and it, it happens the same on our side. Every time we see them applying something or looking for some kind of data, we also look and understand, okay, but if you want this, would this be useful? And so uh, I think that having the, that's the power of having uh, uh, in doing embedded research and having uh, uh, longitudinal deployments is that uh, we have uh, a conversation going on. And I, I think we somehow converge. It, it, it's the, I think that you, the things that Diogo was talking about were more uh, when we really don't know and we want to discover something we do activities that try to abstract some of these things and make them like everything is possible. Now let's, let's imagine that there are no barriers, but I, I, I think that even just by having the platform and doing even small advances or showing what the current models, what we, the type of activities we could uh, uh, discover, for example, and the type of, of information we can give, then they come back to us with more, asking for more or asking for some tweaks that we didn't think of. And so I think that's, that dialogue is the way to, to go. And I, I think my question to Diogo is uh, if you can remember of remember situations where this, where this happened and, and we kind of continue doing 
things or change a little bit the things that we are doing to accommodate new needs or new things that they learn that maybe we could do. Yes, one example of this is the, the one that I mentioned, for example, the digital questionnaires that at the beginning were not part of data park, but then as one of the areas was using an application, they also saw the, okay, it, it was good if we can have this in a digital way. And then we uh, also integrated that in data park. So it, it's that kind of uh, flexibility, that kind of ongoing uh, development that helps uh, to address the, the, the needs that clinicians uh, may have. One last question, anyone? I have one question. Thanks for the excellent yes. presentation, Diog. I wanted to ask you something about going for usual care. So uh, at the moment, people were using these bracelets. Do you have plans for how that could play out in usual care? Would people still use the bracelets? And I had like a very small attached question to that is whether there will be some difficulty if people suddenly have uh, moments where they don't understand so much because uh, they don't know all the details about what was happening. Uh, and if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, could you just uh, rephrase the first part, sorry? So if, how do you see this going for usual care? Um, so it was for a pilot, right? Two months, people using this. Would this work for continuing in clinical care? Would you need to make adaptations? Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I wasn't so clear in the presentation, but uh, after that two periods of months of deployment, this is being used at the clinic for three years. So we also have that kind of uh, feedback from the person. So it's uh, yeah, it's an it's an ongoing collaboration. So it's sometimes it's it's difficult because sometimes to have from the other side some things that are not working as expected, and we have to adjust this. So it's not always easy to maintain this for a long term. Uh, you have periods where you have to, of course, always listen to the persons and try to improve your applications, but yeah, it's possible. And uh, we are doing this with Data Park. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think it's the, the message is that, that it's really relevant to have this and it's, it's possible to have it. And, and what kind of hardware are people using now? Uh, as oh, it continues okay. in clinical care? So they are using XCVT uh, as uh, continuous monitoring, uh, as ferrometer for continuous monitoring. And also, uh, in the case of the clinicians, they use uh, a web platform and also a smartphone application. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, uh, and with that, uh, I want to thank again Diogo for the presentation and thank everyone for, for coming. Uh, as with other seminars, we now have a YouTube uh, channel where all these presentations are made available. So you can search for Wide Health Seminars and you, you are able to see any of our past presentations. Uh, they are also available as podcasts in your uh, podcast application. Uh, and uh, in the near future, uh, in, in two weeks, we'll have another event. And again, you, if you uh, have provided us your email, you'll receive an announcement of that seminar. Thank you all for coming and see you soon.